as a bit of background, um, you'll notice the logo at the bottom left of the um, opening slide, which is the logo of the somewhat um, clunkily titled Union of International Speleology's Commission on Volcanic Caves, of which I am a member. Indeed, I'm the editor of their, their um, newsletter, which, which looks to explore and understand caves formed by volcanic processes or in volcanic rocks. Um, lava tubes are merely one type of volcanic cave, but they're probably the most significant and certainly the most numerous and extensive currently known. Um, I've been involved in the exploration of lava tubes now for over 20 years, and it's taken me to some fantastic places. And it's left me on a bit of a crusade to preach to the world how wonderful lava tube caves are, because many people seem to see them as simply very dark black holes in the ground and, and not a lot more to them. I'm going to start off tonight with a literary reference. Um, I suspect that quite a few people in the audience may have read Jules Verne's classic book, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, which describes the descent of a volcanic shaft in Iceland on the mountain of Snæfells, which leads to an extensive set of underground tunnels leading to the centre of the earth before they are rudely ejected back to the surface through the volcano of Stromboli, um, which lies between Sicily and Italy. The picture at the top there actually is the mountain of Snæfells, where, where our hero, Axel, and Professor Lindenbrock descend towards the centre of the earth. As you can see, Snæfells is a rather nice looking mountain. This was taken in 2003. Um, there are, or there is not, a deep shaft near the summit of Snæfells. I haven't personally looked, but plenty of Icelanders who I do trust have been up there and told me there's nothing. However, there are a very large number of lava tube caves on the flank of this mountain, which is a shield volcano and the ideal place for these things to form. So although you're, we're unlikely to get to the centre of the earth through lava tubes, because generally they don't lie that deep beneath the surface, a matter of a few metres to a few tens of metres, they are still fantastically interesting places. And in fact, every bit as interesting to my mind as the fiction that Jules Verne wrote so eloquently over 150 years ago. So it's probably worth at this stage describing a little bit about how lava tubes are formed. Um, I won't go into any great depth, um, partially because it's quite complex, but mostly because I don't really fully understand it myself. And it's fair to say that even those who do, there's still a lot of debate about the, the intimate details of how these places form. At its simplest, the lava tube starts to form when hot lava um, cools at the surface. And of course, as it cools, it solidifies. And the lava then remains fluid beneath the surface. The solidified lava on top insulates that um, molten lava, which will always, of course, be trying to flow downhill because it's a fluid. That then doesn't really do the lava tube ju justice. It's not merely a crusted over surface channel. They actually become pretty much the primary way by which fluid lavas, at least, um, are transported downhill. Um, the insulation provided by the um, by the cooled rock on the surface allows the molten rock underneath to remain hot enough to flow for very considerable distances. You know, we are talking tens of kilometres. Um, the in turn, what that means is that the lava tube doesn't just form inside the lava flow; it actually helps create the lava flow and create the morphology of it. It's quite an impressive and incredible process. And um, I'll show you a few slides in a, in a second that, that illustrate this. But it's worth saying that the lava tube is not merely a by byproduct 
of the lava flow. It is actually an inherent part of it. The so during your eruption, the lava is produced from the volcano. It flows downhill. It crusts over initially, and then we have the lava tending to coalesce into the most efficient routes down towards the sea, and these routes become the lava tubes. And an active lava tube, of course, is not something we can explore. You know, we're talking about molten rock flowing at high speed and at temperatures usually in excess of 1100 degrees Celsius. The fate of most of these lava tubes is fairly ignominious in that at the end of the eruption, they remain full of liquid lava, which gradually solidifies into rock. In some cases, that molten rock partially or totally drains from the tube, leaving a cavity, a lava tube cave. Then as an explorer, we are then fortunate if there is some way to enter that cave. I know of, a, in particular, I can think of a, actually a named cave in Iceland called Hulduhetla, which we explored by geophysics back in 2001. Nobody's ever been in the cave, but it's very certainly there, and it's a very big cave, but there's no way in without actually tunnelling into the cave or drilling into it. The way that we get into these caves is usually through something called a skylight, and you'll see some good pictures of that in the next slide. And given that most of the observations of lava tube formation have occurred in Hawaii, the generic terminology about lava tubes generally is made in Polynesian. So a skylight, which is the hole in the roof of a, cat, of a lava tube, is known as a puka. And there are two types of puka. The most common one is the, what is known as a cold puka. And these generally occur relatively soon um, after the tube formation as the rocks cool and contract and crack and you get a, a failure of the roof and it drops into the cave. The other option, rather unsurprisingly, is a hot puka, of which we have some pictures here. So the difference is a hot puka is a skylight that is open whilst the tube is active. Now, I've never been fortunate enough to see this for real, so I've had to use some other people's photos. Um, the two on the left are from the US Geological Survey. The one on the right is from my old friend, the late Dr. Chris Wood. These show lava, active lava tubes in formation, and actually, obviously, hot pukas, um, during the massive Muna Ulu eruption in 1969. Now, these may be active at this point, but as an explorer, it's relatively easy to tell in most cases whether a skylight was a hot puka or a cold puka by looking at whether the rock is all sort of melted and welded around the entrance. That generally means it was a hot puka or whether it's just fractured geometric rock. So we have to then, as explorers, wait until these caves cool down to a suitable temperature, which can take years. Um, and then we can actually go and explore what's under the surface of our volcanoes. So my introduction to lava tube caving, I've been a caver for 15 years. Um, Totally, totally um, uh, involved with typical limestone caving in the UK and abroad. Uh, when my old friend Chris, Chris Wood, who I mentioned before, who was actually the world's leading um, expert on lava tube formation or volcano speleogenesis, if you want a long word for Scrabble, um, invited me on a trip to Iceland in, in 2000 um, to help him explore and map um, lava tubes, um, and I'll explain where in a second. So Iceland, for anyone interested in volcanoes, is an absolute mecca. It's The island is split by the, the boundary between the tectonic plates covering North America and, and Eurasia, which are gradually moving apart. Um, that leads to a lot of volcanism, and some of you may be aware of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. 
In addition, the reason why there's an island formed at that point on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is there's something known as a mantle plume or a hotspot, which is where convection currents from the mantle bring additional hot rock to, towards the surface. All that translates into volcanoes that are ideal for the formation of lava tube caves in that they, they, they produce fairly fluid basaltic lavas um, in relatively large quantities. Um, and as a result, there are something in excess of 500 known lava tubes in Iceland. Um, given the remote nature of the country, it is still very much the case that many open entrances across the country await um, discovery. So I've been lucky enough to run or be involved in um, about nine expeditions to Iceland over the years and explored caves over much of the country, ranging from the Reykjanes Peninsula near Reykjavik um, through to the area um, where it says Grimsvörten and Larky, um, which are down here and in the very remote Auskjö region, which is this area here. And we've been fortunate enough to discover many kilometres of new cave, much of which has been very, very interesting. So I'll give a little bit of a taste of what Icelandic caving is like. Um, so top right is, I guess, what a lot of people would think a lava tube would, would be like. A fairly simple, in this case, semicircular passage cross-section. Um, the slightly odd thing about that one, compared to what you might think, is that the floor there is actually solid ice. This is in Sertsetla, which is probably the most famous cave in Iceland. But all, lava tubes aren't, in some ways, the name lava tube is a little bit misleading. They're, they're lava caves um, because they have shown many, many different passage forms. They're not just tubular. Indeed, my friend Stefan Kemper from Germany, Professor Stefan Kemper, is running a single-handed um, campaign to have them renamed as Pyroducts, um, which is a fabulous name, but I don't think it will catch on. So what sort of feet, you know, and to illustrate that, the picture on the left is in another cave called Buri, which you'll hear a little bit more about in a moment. And that shows a frozen lava waterfall, a lava fall. So Haley is sat there um, at the top of the lava fall. And you can see the lava's dropped down here. And then there's a rather nicely formed plunge pool underneath. Um, Maybe a little bit difficult to see because everything there is this rather nice chocolate brown color, but quite quite an amazing thing to see. You know, this was a waterfall of liquid rock at some point, probably about 10,000 years ago. Because we're Subterranea Britannica, I promised Tony that I would talk about some of the ways in which lava tube caves have been used by people. And you can see the picture bottom right of this rather superb sort of bass relief face um that's my other half Haley, looking at it and she she's actually an archaeologist by trade originally and um, we were most excited to find these in search settler um, and we were rather surprised that nobody else seemed to have commented on them and um, there was even one of these actually under the ice in the floor of the cave um we actually found out from my good friend bjorn bjorn Horsen, that this was actually a modern artist who had used the cave as a, an art gallery and that, uh, that he'd actually carved some of the breakdown rocks into the caves. So this was a modern artist using the cave um, as, as, a, as a gallery. Um, and this is not unique, actually, using lava tube caves for artistic reasons. And you'll see, see more of that later. So I mentioned Buri. Um, this is a cave very close to my heart. Um, I can't lay claim to have found this cave. That that honour um, rests with another good friend of ours um, known as Guthmunder Brynjar Thorsteinsson 
Fortunately, he answers to the name of Bibby, um, which makes makes life a bit easier. But he discovered this cave by, um, from a cold puka on the slopes of a mountain called Burfal, which means the, the Whale Mountain in southern Iceland. And this was a cold puka with lots of breakdown. It's quite a large collapse feature. And Bibby pulled a few rocks out of the floor and found an absolutely enormous lava tube, um, significant in length because it's about a kilometre long, and a lava tube over about a kilometre long is significant, but far more significant for the size of the passages inside. Um, Bibby and his best mate Bjorn called us in the UK and asked if whether we could map this cave to a very high level of accuracy, which we, we came out and duly did. Now, the two photos on the left may well not be a surprise that lava tube caves in Iceland, you tend to find some fantastic ice formations. It has to be said that these form actually mostly in summer, and they're usually only found relatively close to the entrance of the cave. Basalt is a very permeable rock, so when it rains... Um, sheltering in a lava tube is just slightly de delaying the inevitable. But what happens is, obviously, Iceland has very cold winters, but when it's very cold, there's no moisture in the cave because the, the overlying rock is, is frozen. However, in the summer, the lo low-lying passages near the entrance trap cold air, and as the, as the ice melts or the rain permeates, into the into the cave it freezes on on contact with the cold air and it forms these tr terrific ice formations which are wonderful as a photographer you, you can have some really good fun with these and then the picture on the right shows the scale of the passage in Bury. as you can see it you can see the two figures in the photo um this rather magnificent sort of eight to ten meter high and wide passage with this lovely smooth floor. It must be said that the first half kilometre or so of the cave doesn't have this smooth floor. It has a very mobile floor of broken um, rock and breakdown, which is hard going. But then it goes into this lovely floor. So in this case, what's happened is that the, the active lava river drained roughly halfway out of the tube before solidifying. And indeed, you can see um along here and here a previous level of the lava river when the cave was active um very very impressive cave um and a great privilege to be some of the well being the the third person into it um because only bjorn and bibby had been in before us but these sorts of discoveries are still being made in iceland this happened 15 years ago in 2005 but these sorts of discoveries are still being made on a regular basis in Iceland. Another thing that people sometimes find surprising is that just like you get stalagmites and stalactites in a limestone cave, you get them in lava tubes. There are two types of formation within a lava tube, and I'll explain the other sort later. The, the, the formation shown here, the stalagmites on the left, and the rather wonderfully eccentric lava straw on the right are what's known as primary formations. These are formed from the rock that the lava tube is created from. As the, the, after the lava river has largely left the cave, or completely left the cave, the cave is still very hot, and the rocks in the walls and the roof of the cave start to cool down but not all of the minerals within the rock cool at the same rate. And what tends to happen is that the heavier parts of the rock cool first and expand and solidify first. They, as they solidify, they expand and they squeeze out the lighter fractions, which then drip and bubble rather like you get on a candle. And they can form the most amazing formations. And these segregate segregates as they're known these um lighter fractions that are squeezed out of the rock have incredible sheens to them sort of wonderful gunmetal colors um 
and they, they can be very colourful as well. Um, it's always bad form to break a stalagmite or a stalactite. Um, at least if you do it in a limestone cave, you can have the consolation that it will grow back over the coming millennia. Um, obviously, with a lava tube, it will never come back. Um, so quite rightly, um, lava tube explorers are very, very protective about these sort of formations. Um, I'm not going to give any locations of where these these caves are. In, uh, these are both in, apart from the fact they're in Iceland. But the one on the left, for instance, not only is the cave securely gated, but the entrance is actually hidden under a pile of rocks in the middle of the moorland. Um, you would never, ever find it um, if it wasn't for knowing local guys. Very protective. And in Iceland, the Icelandic Speleological Society, um, and just check my Icelandic pronunciation, which is known locally as the Hedlaran Sokna Felags Islands, um, they've actually been given legal um, powers to protect and look after caves in the country. So, you know, they, these guys take this very seriously, and that's not unusual around the world. And you find that, as I say, as volcanic cavers are very cagey about um, being too flippant about locations and protecting these caves, because so many of them before have been horribly damaged by people who really don't know what they're looking at. They do need protecting. Another surprise that we found with Icelandic caves, and actually one of the first I visited, um, lava tubes are not formed by water, and but it's not that unusual for lava tube caves to capture surface streams. Um, this rather wonderful cave that pictures here is a cave called Ytherafossa, which roughly means the subterranean waterfall or the, the waterfalls underground. The picture at bottom right and at the top center are of a rather unique chamber the roof of this chamber is probably around five or six meters thick, but it's also the bed of a lake, um, a lake called Lars Bolivarten. Um, and because basalt is porous, you can see the water cascading through cracks in the rock. Um, this was quite a spectacular discovery. I mean, the rest of the cave is fairly spectacular. It's nearly two kilometers long. So it's a major cave by lava tube standards. It's a world-class cave. Um, but the team we were caving with this at the time, you can now drive, you can now drive to the cave almost. Um, but at the time we found it, it was a very long and arduous walk in. And most of our team, we, we surveyed most of the cave, which is dry. And then we reached the streamway, which you can see bottom left. And the rest of the team chickened out of getting their feet wet. Um, so myself and Chris um, and Phil Collett, who's in the bottom left, and Chris who's on bottom right and amongst the waterfalls, uh, we pushed up this stream, um, knowing that we were going to have wet feet for a very long walk home. Um, and of course, this being Iceland, the water wasn't particularly, um, particularly warm. Um, and as we pushed up this passage, the water got deeper and deeper and then we got to a point where the water was about waist deep and the passage partially obstructed with boulders. But we could hear this terrific roaring ahead. Um, so myself and Chris removed these boulders and we or moved them out of the way. And we squeezed through into this this rather wonderful chamber, which, although this was 20 years ago, still still remains as one of the highlights of my caving career. Again, for the for those who, you know, bring back into the spirit of sub brit and man man use of caves um the picture on the left is the entrance of a cave called hestedler and as you can see it's been sort of walled up into this rough entrance hestedler um translates as horse cave and there's quite an and that the reason it's called that is that it was used as a stable um it's quite common in iceland to find caves that have been used for stabling various animals. We've also surveyed a see the headler sheep cave. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite normal. What may be a little bit more unusual as a man made or a man use of this cave as a little anecdote to it. 
So Hestedler lies very close to the international airport at Keplavik. And at the end of one of our expeditions, I think it was 2007, um, it may have been 2005, um, we had a very early flight and some of the team wanted to spend the night in, in a hostel accommodation, but the cheapskates amongst us thought it was a bit much to spend the money for half a night effectively in a hostel. So we just knowing where Hestedler was and it was close to the um, airport and it was dry, we decided to bivy in or bivouac in in Hestedler for the for the evening. So we drove towards Hestedler and, and right next to the cave is a very large layby. And we got to the layby and it was full of the most amazing collection of Winnebago's um, and vast numbers of people. And as we passed this lot, this hooded figure stepped out into the road straight in front of our um land cruiser and phil who was driving had to slam on the brakes and swerve round him i was sat in the passenger seat and me and phil turned around and looked at each other and both immediately said we just almost ran over clint eastwood and it was clint eastwood and he was filming um it was one of the two films he made about the battle for iwo jima in the second world war he made one from the american point of view called flags of our fathers and one from the Japanese point of view called Letters from Iwo Jima. And I can't remember which of the two films it is, but one of them, there is a shot taken from inside he Hestedler, looking out onto the, the lavas in Iceland, pretending to be a Pacific island during the Second World War. So a rather unusual man use of a cave in Iceland. So Iceland's pretty cold, um, very lovely place. But um, again, my old friend Chris said, do you want to go somewhere warmer? So he took me to Lanzarote. And I'm guessing that quite a lot of people here have been to Lanzarote on holiday. And Lanzarote lies there in the Canary Islands, which is just off the coast of Africa. You can see here in the upper picture. Um, and it's part of the Canary Islands chain. The Canary Islands are all volcanic islands. Uh, they're formed not on a plate boundary, but, but from a hot spot. Um, they're still relatively active. And most of the islands in the uh, Canaries have significant lava tube caves, with the most significant being Lanzarote, Tenerife, and El Hierro. But there are there are caves on all of the islands, albeit that Lagomera, that they're, you have to search pretty damn hard to find the two of them. And I think the longest is five metres long. But Lanzarote, as well as being warmer than Iceland, is has a rather fantastic volcanic um, heritage. So picture at the top left shows a fantastic volcano known as Monte Corona, which is the highest point on Lanzarote. And from the slopes of Monte Corona extends a really quite remarkable cave system. The, the Corona lava tubes, of which there's a map at the bottom right produced by my, my friend Lauren Smets from the Netherlands. Um, it's not a single cave. It's a series of related caves that are part of the same system that are not physically connected, at least not yet. And but it is quite remarkable in that it runs almost all the way from the volcano down to the sea and then continues under the sea. So there are collapse features. High up on the mountain here, which then run into the rather magnificent Cueva de los Verdes, which runs all the way down here. And is, is an incredible cave system. There's a, a section which is inaccessible, and then you have the Cave of the Seven Lakes, then the Jameo del Agua here, and then finally, off the map, is the Atalantida Tunnel, which runs down this way for nearly two kilometres under the sea. So it's it's quite a remarkable system in that it runs all the way from the lava from the, the volcano down under the sea. So presumably this, this lava tube formed when the sea level was much lower than it is today. 
It's also remarkable because, and if you'll excuse my French, it's bloody big. So if you look at the two photos here, these are in the central section of um, Cueva de los Verdes, and you can see the size of the cavers in the passage here and here, um, which give you a sense of scale. It's an absolutely enormous cave system, uh, and the passage sizes are tremendous. Um, really, really fabulous cave to visit. Um, really interesting because there's the opportunity for through trips between various entrances. Um, and of course, as a caver, Lanzarote is it's a relatively easy place to get to. There's cheap accommodation, cheap flights. But unfortunately, um, the, there is now starting to be some politics and restrictions on cave exploration on the island, um, which is a real shame because um, it's starting to complicate caving visits. Um, but it's a terrific cave to visit and highly recommended. There are many other caves on Lanzarote as well. Um, but some of these lie within the, the Timan Fair National Park, for which if you do not have express permission, you can rapidly um, rack up a €6,000 fine for stepping off a footpath. Um, so let, let, God knows what they would charge um, or fine you for caving without permission. Um, I have tried to get permission to visit um, to explore caves in Timan Fair, but have never been successful. Um, a local team did do some work about five years ago and actually mapped a very large cave system. But then they since they since when they've been denied any further access. The passages, as well as being large, have some terrific passage forms. And this is in a part of the cave um, that lies close to a cold puka. And in the, the, the collapse features, the pukas in the Canaries, known as Hamios. And this particular piece of passage lies close to Hamio Hentes, um, which is the middle entrance to the Cueva de los Verdes system. And this, this shows some really interesting features. So we have Aubrey here stood in the middle of the passage, and you'll notice this bulge in the wall. So this, this shows, this is what's known as a lateral bench, and this would have been formed when the lava was flowing at about that level in the passage. And you can see another bench on the other side. Since when the, the lava has dropped down inside the cave. The keen eyed amongst you as well will notice this little, what looks like a little dry stone wall running down here. This is what's known as a levee. And this, is, this would have formed near the end of the eruption when the lava river was down at this level and not not the complete width of the passage so it was actually depositing along the cooling edge of it um lava material and, and producing this this levee so and and then finally you'll notice that the walls appear to be sort of shiny um and this is due i talked about to the the segregates that form the lava stalagmites and stalactites they can also form linings on the inside of the cave, which give these terrific sheens. Um, and actually, some of the yellowish colour in here is probably bacterial mats as well, which I'll come back to later, which sound awful, but are very, very interesting. Um, I've got a question from Peter Burgess. Why can't a lava cave continue to form in the underwater slopes of a volcano? Um, lava and water do not mix. Um, it, Lava touches water and it tends to go bang very, very spectacularly as it generates steam. Um, the end of the Atalantida tunnel, and not that I've ever been there, I'm not a cave diver, and the, the very few cave divers who have have had quite, quite um, dramatic stories to tell about getting there, ends at a rather large chamber, which is believed to have been where the um, lava hit the saturated level of the sea. So it wasn't actually under the sea as such, but under the, where the rock became saturated. And there, the, the theory is that there was a large steam explosion within the still plastic rock. But if you look at, and if you look online, you will find video of this, of lava tubes meeting the sea in, in Hawaii. And what you get is, is pretty large, spectacular explosions. The, the lava is 
cooled very, very violently. You get um, pumice forming and you get a lot of gas in it. So so generally, any time that lava hits water, it just tends to go bang um, and it stops being fluid. I hope that answers your question, Peter. Another interesting aspect of the corona system is that it's formed on multiple levels. So you can see Haley here sat on the upper level and you can see Andrea down here on the lower level. Um, as an aside, it shows for the cave photographers amongst you or the underground photographers, the benefits of your models wearing bright colors because Haley stands out, whereas Andrea doesn't. And you can see that there's this sort of crater in the floor and that's showing communications between two different levels of the tube. Um, there's still quite a lot of debate. Um, personally, I, I don't see that there, there should be any at all about whether the lava flowing within a lava tube actually erodes the base rock on which the lava is flowing. I think it's pretty obvious it must do. And there's some very good evidence within this cave, actually, that shows that. But what it means is that you can get multiple levels forming as the as the lava cuts down different levels through the cave. And this is a good example of it. You'll also notice that this hole looks a bit like a crater with what looks to be sand all around it. Now, this sand is very, very white. Um, it's very mobile. Any any draft that will be kicked up. This is quite unusual to the to Lanzarote. Um, and. It's there in vast quantities in parts of some of the caves. We think this is gypsum, and we think it derives from these rather delicate, or is related to, these rather delicate gypsum flowers that you can see on the left here. That, that, that entire photo on the left is probably two and a half, three inches across. So I've mentioned primary formations. I'm now moving into secondary formations. These are much more akin to the calcite stalactites and stalagmites that you would see in a limestone cave in that they form slowly and are formed by the action of water on minerals within the basalt. The difference being in lava tubes that the range of minerals that you can get forming these formations is very wide. It can be calcite and you'll see some good examples of that later on. Uh, in this case, it's gypsum, and it's probably gypsum with some biological elements in it as well. But I've even seen, um, it's not uncommon to see silicas and even opal um, stalactites um, and stalagmites in, in lava tube caves. But we think what happens is that this gypsum breaks down to form this sand in this case. Again, moving on to how have um, lava tubes been used by man? Well, Part of, part of the Cueva de los Verdes system is a show cave. Um, in part of it, there is actually a seismological monitoring station. Um, but probably the most interesting on Lanzarote is the Jameo del Agua, which there's a couple of photos here. For those of you who've been to Lanzarote, you're probably aware of the artist Manrique, who has a, had a great influence on the culture in Lanzarote and in actually uh, preserving the, the old style of the island compared to the rest of the Canaries in terms of the whitewashed houses and, and very square houses. One of the things that Manrique did was to take over the Jameo del Agua, which is the lowest part of the Corona system that lies above the water level. And he sort of turned it into this rather amazing art park, including a swimming pool. It includes a bar. It includes an auditorium for music. Um, you can visit it as a tourist if you go to Lanzarote. And there's even above the above the um, show cave, there's a really good um, museum and interpretive centre about the, the, the volcanology of the island. Very, very highly recommended. So we now move the next visit I made or the next area I went to. Um, and this was my first um exposure to the uis commission on volcanic caves and, and we went to mexico for the symposium on volcanic caves in 2006 and we're talking about this sort of area here between mexico city and veracruz um part of the the mexican volcanic region for anyone um 
for anyone who's visited Mexico or knows anything about caving in Mexico, they know there's terrific variety of limestone caves. I've not visited a single one of them, but there's a lot of lava tubes as well. Um, Hillary, are lava tubes good places for quartz? Um, I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm not aware of seeing any quartz, but I, um, I've not seen any personally, but um, I'm not sure is the answer. I've not seen any references to it. Um, so Mexico City to Veracruz, there's a large volcanic area, which is dominated on the top left by this rather superb volcano called Popocatapetl, um, which roughly translates as the Lord who smokes. And he's smoking away there in that picture from 2006. Um, possibly the world's most dangerous volcano. It's highly explosive and it sits right next to one of the world's biggest cities in, in Mexico City. Um, certainly has the potential to kill millions um, if it has a catastrophic explosion, which there is evidence has happened at least three or four times in the past. In my ignorance, I expected the scenery in Mexico to be something out of the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, it turned out that most of the caving was an altitude of about 3000 metres. So as you can see from the, the bottom right photo, it's more like a sort of alpine woodland than um, cactuses, etc. Um, but what are the caves? Well, the caves here are a real education. Um, the cave, I'm going to talk about the system of Tlacatenco, which is the map on the right. That's a plan view of the cave system produced by my friend Ramon Espinosa. Um, as you can see, these caves are highly complex. And some people, I think, just assume that a lava tube is a simple single tube. It can be. But just like any cave, they can have a range of different forms. In this case, the situation is even more complex in that you have a deep lava tube that was the main conduit, which at various times during the eruption was overtopped. As the, as the flow increased, the tube was not able to um, carry all the flow. So actually you had secondary eruptions from the underlying tube, which then formed a superficial set of tubes, which are the complex ones lying above. And this all lies underneath a village called San Juan Tlacatenco. And these caves really are remarkable. Um, you can see bottom left there, a, a typical junction between two passages with linings. These junctions are every few meters. The caves are also on a very steep slope. So there's lots of lava falls, as you can see in the top left photo here. Really, really spectacular caves. Um, and actually some of the world's longest, um, the longest, there's about 25 kilometers a cave in that survey of which the longest single cave is about six and a half kilometers, um, Cueva Ferra Caril, which these photos are taken in really remarkable place. Even Ramon who had, who had mapped these caves had to you to leave, um, lighted tea lights at junctions to remember the way back. You know, it really is probably the most complex cave of any description I've ever been in. Really quite, quite amazing. Um, and I mentioned the lower tube. Um, so this is this is the main conduit which lies at a greater depth. This wonderful name of Chimalacatepec. And this is the deepest lava tube known in the continental Americas. Has a depth of just over 200 meters in total vertical range. And it's entered by a 15 meter, that's 50 feet roughly in old money, vertical pitch. I really wanted to show this picture because, again, it's another man use of this cave. These caves were first explored in the modern era by my friend Ramon um, uh, and his friends in the late 90s. And the picture on the bottom left shows the main conduit within Chimalacatepec. Just beyond this photo, the passage lowers to a crawl and then opens up into a final chamber where the lava floor meets the roof. When they first entered this chamber, they found a number of jade oil lamps in there. Quite a remarkable find. There were jade oil lamps, there were beads, um, and they was also the remains, the charred remains of wooden torches, which they had carbon dated. 
and they dated from the 16th century. And it's the summation is that, that it's believed that this was some desperate attempt by the indigenous population to make some sort of offering to try and drive off um, the, the, the conquistadors. Um, but it's, you know, bearing in mind that it's not an easy place to get to now as a, as a modern day explorer. Um, it must have been quite an adventure and for um, for a bunch of um, of indigenous people with no equipment to, to negotiate the vertical drops and with no real proper lighting. Must have been a, you know, quite an incredible endeavour. The caves in this area also have some fantastic features. So on the left, um, it shows Peter here sat upon a natural rock bridge. This is almost a lava tube forming inside a lava tube. So as the lava river has dropped, part of the, the top of it has crusted over. And so you've got a lava tube forming within a lava tube. The picture on the right, this big lump in the roof here, is what's known as a rafted block or even a lava ball. So this block would have actually floated in the lava river. Um, I'm a naval architect by, by profession, so I know how things float. So that rock would have been very slightly less dense than the fluid uh, molten rock. So it would have actually floated. And at this point in the tube, it has stuck to the roof and then it's become actually welded there. And so all these thousands of years later, it's still stuck to the roof, even though Stefan appears to be trying to beckon it down to drop on his head. And then again, we come back to the man uses of these caves. So on the left there, we have Ramon Espinaza, and the photo isn't great, but Ramon is actually leaning on a wall that has been built across the passage. We have absolutely no, well, I don't say we have no idea. We think in this case that that wall was built to prevent or to, to allow sediment to back up because this cave takes water in heavy rains and it the, the summation was that it was trying to allow silt to settle out from the water so that clean water would come out the other end of the cave um but it's not entirely sure and throughout the tlakatenko system there are large quantities of pottery of which this is a rather nice example this pot is probably only um two or three inches across in diameter but there's loads of these and loads of fragments Sad to say that there is no, or has been to my knowledge, absolutely no archaeological investigation of these remains inside the Tlacotenko caves. The other rather sad part about these caves is because they lie underneath the village, and in many places the passages come very close to the surface, um, that many people within the village in a number of places have breached the cave roof and used them as places to run their wastewater and sewage pipes into, which is rather sad really. Um, it also needs to be pointed out as well that these are actually there's some rather dramatic um, biology within these caves. Um, Ramon's brother is is actually a, a really um, eminent cave biologist, and I wouldn't have thought that two little white bugs could be so important. But he's he's actually found some rather incredible evidence, genetic evidence for um, backing up Darwin's theories and showing. Um, evolution actually taking place in these caves. I'm not the right person to ask, but really quite impressive work has been done in here. So we're now going to move right across the other side of the Pacific and we're going to move to Korea. And so for those who know your geography, this set of islands is Japan. We have China over here and over here. There's your demilitarized zone with South Korea beneath it. And then this little island down here, Jeju Island, is where we're going. Um, Jeju lies off the south coast of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, and it's a rather amazing place. So on the right, you have a general photo of the island. Um, this feature here, is a volcanic tuff ring. So this was a, 
an explosive volcano event many thousands of years ago. It regales under the wonderful name of Shongshang Ichilbong. But more importantly, the main island lies above that in the photo, and you can see the central volcano just in there. That's Mount Halasan. That's the highest point in South Korea, and it's a huge volcano. Um, Jeju is sort of semi-independent from Korea, has its own governor, and it has these one of the, the trademarks of the island, these fantastic grandfather stones, as they're called, which are sort of similarly reminiscent of the heads on Easter Island. Um, so there's a lot of speculation as to whether Jeju had some sort of Polynesian influence or not. But on the slopes of Halasan are some really remarkable caves. Um, and this is a photo of one of them. This is from Soshiongul. Gul is the um, Korean word for cave. And I mentioned, I've mentioned, made several mentions of my friend, my, my late friend, Dr. Chris Wood. He was instrumental in getting these caves um, uh, to become World Heritage Sites. Um, and they really are really world class. This is Soshiongul. There's actually, you can see water coming through it here, and you can see some a rather fine passage shape um, in, in the cave. I'm, I put this photo in largely because I really like it. I'm very proud of it. Um, but um, but there's there are many, many miles of fantastic cave passage all around Jeju Island. The, the, the granddaddy of these caves is Manjangul. Um, the really amazing thing about Manjangul is the size of the passages, um, as you can see here. Um, these, you know, the passages are this sort of size, and there's about seven or eight kilometers of passage like this in the cave. Um, the one on the left, you can see the sheer size of the passage. Um, when we visited in 2008, there was also an International Union of Speleology um, meeting on the island. And the, the then president of the UIS at the time was a British caver called Andy Evis. And I sort of chided Andy on the fact that he hadn't brought any caving kit with him. And he said, well, there's no point. He said, lava tubes are all the same. They're all boring. So I managed to give him a, find him a, a lamp and a helmet. And we dragged him down Manjangle and to say he was a bit blown away. You know, bearing in mind that Andy was one of the guys who's found some of the world's biggest passages in limestone caves in Borneo. Uh, not Borneo, sorry, in um, Sarawak. Um, and he was a bit blown away by this cave. Um, and one of his comments in the pub afterwards, we said, you gave me a lamp, he said, but you didn't give me a bike. He said, I could have ridden through that. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, I would hazard a guess that you could actually ride a double-decker bus through it. Um, the, the picture on the right, actually, I think is is rather more interesting in that you can see the various levels at which the lava has flowed through this rather fine canyon passage in the cave. And it really is spectacular. And if you ever do find yourself on Jeju Island, which is a fantastic place to go just for the beaches, if nothing else, you can visit much of this cave as, as large chunks of it are a show cave. Um, and it's rather well done as well. Um, as well as the sheer size of these, these caves on Jeju, there are some fantastic features. Um, so on the left, we have the world's largest lava stalagmite. Um, if you look carefully down on the bottom left, down here, you can just see the end of the show cave in Manjangul. Haley there is stood just beyond the end of the show cave, so we were allowed to go beyond. And what's happened here is that lava has flowed into the lower level passage from a, from a passage higher up. And this stalagmite is about seven metres high. It's really quite impressive. And then the right-hand picture, which is taken in another cave called Wahilgul, shows this rather dramatic lateral bench. And if you remember the last lateral bench I showed you was a sort of curving, bulbous affair. This is a, this this has formed into a shelf, maybe eight inches thick, but sticks out from the wall over a meter. Um, and again, that correlates to a previous to a to a level that the lava river was flowing at some point during the eruption. few more features to look at on top left is a rafted block so I'm, i showed the lava ball a lafted, rafted block um in um mexico earlier with stefan pointing up a bit in the roof 
in this case, the rock has wedged against the wall of the passage and then it's been sculpted by the flowing lava. And you can see the shape, the streamlined shape. So the lava would have been flowing that way. And it's shaped this rock into this into this almost sort of like arrowhead type shape. Really quite, quite remarkable. And the bottom right, you can see this this beautiful gunmetal lining and then some sort of yellow gunk lying in the, the, the lower or in the depressions within that, that lining. These are a bacterial mat. Um, if you'd asked me many years ago whether bacterial mats were, were interesting, I'd have probably said no. But um, I was shown an awful lot about these by, by another friend, Diana Northup, who runs a wonderful website called caveslime.org. And the stuff that Diana, she works at the University of Texas, and the research, um, particularly for medical applications, that they're finding from these very rare um, bacterial mats in, in lava tube caves is really quite remarkable. We then move on to another another thing that makes the caves on Jeju Island, un well, not quite unique, but remarkable, is that over much of the island, the lava has become overlain by coral sands, which are calcium carbonate, the same stuff as limestone. And what's happened is over the hundreds and thousands of years, this, um, just like in a limestone cave, this, this coral sand has been dissolved by rainwater and redeposited in the in the lava tubes below as stalagmites and stalactites. So in the left-hand picture, you can see a calcite straw there. That's actually about six metres long. Quite amazing. We think that these may actually be reinforced by tree roots in them, which may, make, may allow them to grow to these extraordinary lengths. And then you can see curtains and straws much like you would in any limestone cave, but set against the blacks and deep colours of the lava tube. It's quite remarkable. So this cave is called Yongchongdonggul, and it was found accidentally in 2006 when the local council were putting in telegraph poles and their post hole digger penetrated the roof of the cave. Um, the cave is about one and a half kilometers long, and it is completely lined with magnificent calcite formations. Access to this cave is quite rightly severely restricted. We were very fortunate to be allowed to enter it, um, but we had, to, they, we had to sort of wash our footwear every um, few hundred yards or few hundred meters. Um, much of the cave, they'd laid polythene flooring down so we didn't uh, muddy anything up. But it's also interesting in that if you look at, Top left, there's a very rough diagram of the lava tube system. So the, the bottom of that map lies high up on the slopes of um, Mount Halasan. You can see Manjang, you can see the area of Manjangul Cave. But towards and also as you come down a series of other caves, you can see Yongchongdonggul and then Gimyonggul and then Dangchom Jang Chom Muldonggul. Um up until, as I say, 2006, Yongchondonggul was not known. Gimyonggul is a separate cave to Manjangul, but it's part of the same system. And it consists of a relatively short section of very large cave passage. But there was a local legend that spoke of the, the great cave beyond Gimyonggul. And when the first explorers entered Yongchondonggul after the, um, the breaching of the roof, they found pottery in there. And interestingly, the bottom right hand picture shows a, a calcite crystal pool, which has got wood in it. These objects here and here are the remains of the torches that people some 1400 years ago used to illuminate their visits to Yongchongdonggul. They're quite an interesting discovery, this one. So we'll now move somewhere a little bit closer to home. We'll move to the island of Sicily. I'm guessing that most people know that Sicily lies off the, the end of the boots of Italy. And here we're talking about the area around Mount Etna, which lies here. Um, none of the caves on Etna are particularly huge, um, but there are an awful lot of them. And 
they're still being made. As you may be aware, Etna's erupting at the moment and lava tubes are forming. Um, and the probably the most significant cave on on uh, lava tube cave on Sicily, because there are also caves in limestone and gypsum on the island, is Rotta di Tre Levelli, the um, cave of the three levels. Um, like a number of caves on Etna, access to it is relatively straightforward. It lies right next to the road. The picture bottom left doesn't actually show the entrance to Trailer Valley because I couldn't find any pictures of it that I'd taken. That's of another cave called Grotta de Cassoni, but Trailer Valley is a similar distance from the road. What's really interesting about this cave is its depth. So almost immediately inside is a vertical drop of about six or seven meters, followed by yet another one of about five meters. And then you enter this rather dramatic large gallery on the top right. What doesn't really what really doesn't come out on the photo though is how steep this passage is. And the cave actually has a total vertical range or depth of just over 300 meters. It's just over a thousand feet deep. Um, it has a few crawly bits, but at the top end, it actually enters the eruptive fissure from where the lava came from, which is blocked by loose boulders, but a, a fantastically interesting cave. But given that Sicily is very well populated, many of the caves have had some form of man use. And I'll just show two examples. The first here is the Grotta del Santo. So the entrance to the cave lies within this little compound with the altar above it as sh or shrine above it as shown in the top left photo and inside the cave which lies within that compound is, is another shrine and altar followed by about 800 meters of passage clearly this has religious use i think that's fairly obvious and the reason being is that local legend has it that during an eruption of etna in the 19th century that the Virgin Mary appeared from this cave and halted the lava just short of a village. And so obviously this has become quite um, a well-known religious site. Um, and I, I believe that they hold a procession every year where they, they carry an effigy of the Virgin Mary out of the cave. For the gastronauts amongst you, this is a far more interesting place. This is the Grotta di Ladroni or the Grotta di Ladri, which roughly translates as the robber's cave or the bandit's cave. Um, you can see the entrance on the right, and you can see Haiti here stood on some steps carved out into the walls of the passage. Um, this is interesting because this lies high on the slopes of Etna um, above Catania, and this was actually used to make ice cream, or at least to store the ice to make ice cream in Catania. So in winter, they would stockpile large amounts of snow and ice into this cave. And that, of course, would chill the air and it would keep through the entire summer in the cave. And then the ice men would cut chunks of this ice and then run like like Billio down the mountain with this ice before it melted to give it to the ice cream makers. Um, very, very short cave, but very interesting and very easy to access very close to the road. We're now going to move back to the Canary Islands and we're going to move to Tenerife over here, which, again, I'm guessing quite a few people are familiar with from holiday. And Tenerife is dominated by the rather magnificent mountain of um, Tady, shown in the top left, which is a huge volcano. Um, goes up to about 14,000 feet, I think. Um, and again, Tenerife ha has a vast quantity of lava tube caves on it including the longest lava tube known outside of the Hawaiian Islands. And this is the wonderful Cueva del Viento. So the, you can see a map of the cave at the bottom centre. Um, this was produced by the, the, the cavers on Tenerife. Um, and the cave is really quite remarkable. It has over 18 kilometres of passage. Um, it has a total vertical range of well over 500 meters and the cave is formed on three distinct levels. Um, maybe difficult to see on the survey, but the deepest level is green. The main middle level is blue and the higher levels are orange. Um, the 
upper level, the orange one, consists of some really quite unpleasant low crawls that you can see Andy in on the top left. Um, lava in lava tubes is very sharp. And one of our colleagues a few years back described the experience of transiting some of the upper level passages in this cave as, quote, being like swimming naked in a bottle bank. But um, but doing but by traversing these passages within Cueva del Viento, you can move between the distinct systems, which are this area down here, which is the Cueva Sobrado, and this side, which is Cueva de los Breveritas, and then Cueva de los Piquets. And I'll explain why there's a sort of break roughly around about there in a second. But much of the cave is formed of these lovely galleries such as the one shown on the top right here with this sort of welded clinker floor. Um, really quite quite a spectacular place. So a few shots, general shots of Cueva del Viento. Um, top left is Haley. My, my partner stood in the Sobrado section. You can now visit this as a show cave um, if, you, if you are visiting Tenerife. Um, if you go to the town of Ico de los Vinos, um, this part of the cave you can actually visit as a, as a tourist. Um, top right is within a section of the cave known as Galleria de los Ingleses, which is part of the, the deepest lower level of the cave. And you can see the size of this rafted block now welded into the floor, which is big enough for four to sit on there. And then there's some just generally nice passage shapes within the cave. Very well worth a visit. But again, access to the remoter parts of the cave is strictly controlled. And I'll explain why later. In this slide, in fact. So the main issue with man use of the caves on Tenerife and particularly the Cueva del Viento area, is due to the caves lying underneath the town of Ico de los Vinos. So top left is the entrance to the Cueva de Hoya de San Felipe, which, as you can see, lies literally right next to the road. There's actually a house just above it. Um, the bottom left picture is the entrance to Cueva de, de Candelaria, which is another part of the system. You can see it's fenced. You can just make out the house over here. And in fact, there are a number of houses just, just out of shot to the left. What that means is that in both of these two caves, so Hoya de San Felipe and Candelaria, they've become very badly polluted with sewage, unfortunately, which is an um, a, you know, artefact of lying under the town. Possibly slightly more interestingly, is you can see our um, friend Ian there stood at the lower, this is almost the lower end of the Breveritas section of the cave. And just out of shot is a wall built across the passage. And about six or seven meters from that wall is another wall that terminates the top end of Cueva de los Piquetes. And as I mentioned, that's why the break is on the, on the, the survey. And what's happened there was that when somebody was building their house, they breached the roof of the cave and they've turned a short section, only six or seven meters of the passage into their wine cellar. Um, this actually led to quite a, quite a vociferous dispute in the seventies when British cavers first surveyed um, Cueva del Viento and claimed it as the longest lava tube in the world. The Americans who had the previous incumbent in Oregon um, quickly latched on to the fact that, it, that actually Cueva del, Cueva, de los, uh, Cueva del Viento was not a single cave because there was this seven metre section missing. Be also because of the fact they lie within the town, the caves have been um, subjected to a lot of vandalism. And for that reason, large sections of the caves are protected by these rather fearsome gates, which are locked and a real pain to open as you can see here if your arms not if the distance between your elbow and your wrist isn't exactly right there's no way you will open those locks so we'll now move to the absolute nirvana of lava tube cavers um, and that's hawaii and we're talking the hawaiian islands as in the map here are formed on a hot spot and what's happened is there's a hot spot currently roughly underneath Big Island here. But the 
plate that the the Pacific plate that the Hawaiian Islands are sat on is moving in that direction. So the big island is the currently active one with the volcanoes of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, which are some of the biggest mountains on Earth. Um, they're both about 14, 15,000 feet above sea level to the summit. But if you measure them from the abyssal plain from which they grow, they are certainly bigger than Mount Everest. Um, but as you move northwest, the islands get older. The majority of the known lava tube caves are on big islands. There are lava tube caves known on the other islands, particularly Maui, but they get less common as the, as the, as the islands get older. And bottom left there, you can see a picture of from what's known as the Saddle Road, which runs between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, just there, looking up to the summit of Mauna Kea. And you might just be able to make out the little white blob of the observatory on the summit of Mauna Kea. So the caves. Caves are rather fantastic. So I'm going to start talking about the Kipuka Kanahina system which lies in the, almost at the southernmost point of um, Big Island. It's currently the second longest known lava tube in the world with a shade over 30 miles of passage. I think that's about 44 kilometres. Um, that side of the island, I should have mentioned on the map, um, the climate in Hawaii is radically different between the east and west coasts. The east coast where the prevailing weather comes from is incredibly wet and is sort of rainforest. The West coast lies in the rain shadow of the two big peaks and is incredibly dry. And the Kapuka Kanahina system lies on the dry side. That's important for later. You will also notice various roots such as just here and here penetrating the roof of the cave. These on Hawaii generally come from a tree called the Ohia, um, which is endemic to Hawaii. Um, and they can be quite dense in places. But in this photo, this is part of the Kanahina system. And you can see these rather lovely levees that are built up as the lava tube was active. Really, really superb cave. And because it's on the dry side of the island, very little water gets into the caves. And what that means is that, bizarrely enough, you get a lot of secondary formations that are these highly soluble um, minerals that if it was any wetter would be washed away and you can see in the top left here you can see the white deposits which are probably some form of gypsum lying on lava stalactites and then red and white um, uh, material lying on stalactites at the bottom left i ought to point out as well as well that caroline who's looking in the bottom left there she actually is a rocket scientist she's looking at cave exploration techniques for for the um for extraterrestrial caves she actually does work for nasa um and on the right here you can see how really quite delicate some of these secondary crystals can be that entire um crystal there is probably 30 millimeters long so really quite delicate and quite beautiful but if you move to the other side of the island the amount of rain that comes through washes all these away however this is more than compensated by the granddaddy of all lava tubes and actually one of the world's greatest caves of any type and this is kazumura cave um and um kazumura cave is just a phenomenal place um by any measure it, the cave is over a kilometer deep in terms of total vertical range it has over 60 kilometers of passage in it. It has 101 entrances. And the, as the crow flies, the distance between the top entrance and the bottom entrance is 19 miles. Um, yeah, it really is quite a dramatic cave. And you can see some pictures of the cave here. And it includes some vertical shafts. Um, sorry, Peter, I didn't pick up your question earlier. Are volcanic gases a danger to be aware of? I've never come across them in lava tube caves. Some other types of volcanic caves are that they, they can be a problem. OK, so we'll move on with Kazumura Cave. So as well as the length of the passage, there are some really quite astounding formations in there. This particular set of formations, they're known as the type, the type known is uh, their blades. 
The method of formation is not known, but they generally lie close to hot pukas, i.e. a skylight that was open when the cave was active. And it's believed that um, cold gases being dragged in by the flow of lava may have a, a, a part in, in their formation. But this one is known as the WOW. Um, I think you can see why. It's rather spectacular. Um, really quite, quite an impressive place. And then you get features like this. This is my personal favourite. This is a this is a plunge pool from a lava waterfall. So the lava plunged down from up here. That's a vertical waterfall of, of over 50 feet, over 15 metres. And, of course, doing that, it, it created a plunge pool underneath it. And then as that rock in the plunge pool has cooled, it is contracted and then broken away as, as the rock has contracted. It wasn't that the lava drained away, it's the solid rock is contracted. And one of the local cavers has estimated from the amount of contraction and the amount that it's, it's dropped as it's contracted, that this plunge pool was in excess of 90 feet deep when the cave was active. Um, Mike, do the caves have abrasive surfaces? Oh, yes. Hence the, um, hence the swimming naked in a bottle bank. Even a hands and knees crawl can become a very desperate affair on lava. Even what appears to be a smooth floor can have little jagged, sharp edges on it. You know, this stuff is essentially pretty much broken glass. Um, so, yeah, you have to be very, you know, need to wear very good gloves, good knee pads, good boots. So we've we've now reached the apex of lava tube caving on Earth. But in recent years, lava tube caving has come to the attention of space agencies. Photos like these from um, from NASA and JPL. Um, from Mars showing what appear to be roof collapses into lava tubes have got the various space agencies, including NASA and the European Space Agency, very keen on the potential of using lava tube caves as essentially environments to put habitats into. Um, so, for instance, the European Space Agency last year actually put out uh, an invitation to tender for people to design a cave exploring robot to take to Mars. Um, so indeed today, in fact, there was an article on CNN talking about the use of huge lava tubes on the moon and Mars for this very reason. It's interesting because I've spent a lot of time, particularly in Iceland, trying to use aerial photos to identify cave entrances and it's never easy. Um, there are some rather grand um, statements being made by astrophysicists who've never even seen a lava tube about what these lava tubes on Mars and the moon are going to be like. I would not be so bold, even after 20 years of exploring these things. I will make one prediction, though, which is whatever these scientists are predicting about these lava tubes, I bet they're wrong. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, and it'll be really interesting to see how um exo volcano speleology um turns out over the next few decades that is the end of my presentation i think we've got a few minutes for questions if anybody wishes to ask any more but i hope that's been of interest and i know it's a little bit different and maybe a little bit outside the scope of the usual subterranean britannica but i hope it's been of interest and and you've enjoyed the, the presentation thank you for, for your attention No questions? In which case, I think, Richard, if you can kill the, kill the presentation, I think we're done. <laughs>